Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, Today, I'm just going to be doing a short audio on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and specifically honing in on the word precede there, as Paul uses it. Um, And, you know, I've obviously been sharing these videos for some time now. I believe I started about a year and a half ago. Um... In November, uh, maybe December, I think it was December of 2017, so not quite a year and a half, but um, have shared quite a few of them on YouTube. I think it's maybe 220 by now, but um, you know, in all these videos, or in most of them, I sort of try to show people that the idea of a literal catching up or a calling up or a rapture of the saints at the end is exactly what the story says, right? It's not uh, it's not something that's made up. It's not out of the norm. It's not out of the realm of possibility considering the other events that we see in that last day, day's period and all the supernatural events that were taking place and how Joel spoke that this time was going to be loaded with supernatural stuff and how Peter confirmed that. And, you know, all these miraculous, crazy, wackadoodle type things are supposedly going on. And it was to the point that it was so radically weird and strange that, um, you know, even in one portion, I can't recall where, but in the New Testament, we have a discussion and they're saying to each other, have you not heard what's been going on in Jerusalem and in Judea? Like, you know, have you not heard of all this supernatural, crazy, wackadoodle stuff that's taking place, right? And so, um, in other words, he's asking him, do you live under a rock? Have you not heard about all this? So, anyways, with all the... um, examples of this supernatural things taking place in the last days, uh, catching up into the heavens as of riding off into the sunset, sort of rolling up the scroll or rolling down the curtain, whatever you want to call it at the end, should be actually pretty easy for people to believe. And in fact, most people do believe it. Uh, Most Christians, most Bible students, most uh, students of the word do believe that that is the final hurrah. That's the final scene. Now, of course, most of them have it wrong in terms of the time, and they've been told that they can jam themselves into a narrative just because they don't understand it and because that's what most people have done over the years. Well, obviously, the fulfilled position comes in and smacks that view around and basically says, hey, that's not going to fly. That just doesn't work. So, um, you know, you have to be able to piece these things together and come to the real conclusion, and that is that A, the coming of the Lord took place exactly when he said it would in that last day's generation, and he came for his saints for salvation, to save them, right? He who endures to the end shall be saved. But, you know, people have argued with me on this whole, you know, rapture thing. Many are in agreement, but many have argued, and, you know, the, 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 the alternative to my view is this idea that they were going that the living ones who remained until the coming of the Lord were going to be just sort of caught up in a sort of you know metaphorical sense where they're caught up into the presence of God right that's that's what it means but it doesn't literally mean that right it just means the so so the ones who had already fallen asleep aka the ones who were dead um, would rise they would experience some sort of literal resurrection out from the spiritual realm up into the heavens right up into a kingdom because if you if you deny and reject that idea then the story you remove heaven completely from the story right and, and most people don't want to do that right this is this whole story represents them going to a place called heaven at the end of their lives so they don't want to do that so um, you know they hold on to that but most people do away with the rapture idea in the fulfilled camp, I should say, because they realize that they have to do something with it. And what they do with it is they say that this catching up, this harpazo, just simply means that you're sort of raptured into the presence of God, right? But there's a little bit of a problem, well, a major problem, and I've reviewed this extensively on many previous audios, but today's audio is going to focus on that word precede in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You see, the living saints were promised that they would receive the exact same inheritance as those who had already died. The exact same thing. There was no difference. There was no, you know, instruction saying that, oh, the dead ones are going to be caught up into a literal spiritual realm, a literal place called heaven, a literal New Jerusalem. But those who are alive and remain will only be caught up sort of metaphorically. They'll stay on the earth, but their catching up is going to be different than the dead ones catching up, right? Their catching up just simply means to be sort of 
raptured into this, you know, presence of God, right? While the other dead saints were literally raptured up into a spiritual kingdom, up into the heavens, where they would receive immort immortality, uh, glorified angelic body, where they would never die anymore, where they wouldn't marry anymore because there's no death there and there's no marriage. You know, they were promised something quite different. No, 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 that's wrong. They were promised the exact same thing. Okay, and when you tie that together, you can see it very clearly, and that's why 90% of Bible-believing Christians believe that way. All right, but the word precede is actually a very powerful word in this um, regard. All right, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul is writing to these Israelites out in the nations in Thessalonica, and he says, but we do not want you to, this is verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, meaning those who are dead that you may not grieve as, as, as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So what you see here is that Paul is basically assuring them that those who had already died, those who had fallen asleep, would rise, right? They would rise from the dead. Okay, now obviously we know this doesn't mean spiritually dead because he's speaking of those in contrast to those who would, would be alive at the coming. There would be a group of saints that were alive and remained until the coming. And then he talks about a, a different group contrasting that to the living ones. He says these are asleep, these would be dead, and they would rise at the coming when he descends with a shout at the last trumpet. Right? But notice what he says here. He says that we who are alive, those of us who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven in the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet, and the dead will rise first. Then we, are, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with him. So the word precede there shows conclusively that they were going somewhere, right? Precede. We will not precede the dead. Now why would Paul use the word precede if this was nothing more than a metaphorical change of status where somehow in the here and now in the living realm they are you know in God's presence whereas they weren't before right I mean let's face it <laughs> these ones were in God's presence before right they had the freaking Holy Spirit dude I mean come on they were right there he was inside of them he was giving them miraculous powers and they were you know raising people from the dead and healing all manner of sickness and casting out demons and drinking crazy shit and walking on water I mean come on dude like these ones weren't in the presence of God before the coming of the Lord? Of course they were. They had the Holy Spirit, which was given from God, right? God was in them, All right? Now, so they had the Holy Spirit. Paul tells them that they would, the ones who lived until the coming of the Lord would not precede the dead. In other words, for those of you who aren't picking up on this, the dead were going somewhere first, and then... Those who were who remained were going there second. That's what precede means. It means that the ones who were alive and remained would not go to that place before those who were already dead. The ones who were dead would be raised first, and then the living would be changed in the twinkling of an eye, caught up together in the clouds with the Lord in the air where they would forever be with him. So the, the point here to really pick up on is that both parties are promised the exact same thing. Okay, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says the same thing. He tells them that, you know, why are you, you know, why are you sad about the ones who have died, whatever, you know, for they will rise and, and 
blah, blah, blah. And then he gives the order of the resurrection and he says, you know, the order is Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ's at his coming, then comes the end. All right, so Christ ra ra rose first, walked out of the tomb, his body did not see corruption like Acts 2 says, meaning that his corpse was not left to rot. He had put on immortality, he had put on a glorified body, and he walked right out of the tomb and he ascended up into heaven, and that's why nobody ever seen him again or saw him again, okay? So he is the prototype. He's the firstborn of the brethren. He ascended up into the clouds. He was glorified and went into heaven. Now, the rest of the brethren, at his coming, would follow suit. They would take the pattern of the prototype. They would be changed to that immortal glorified body. They too would also ascend up into the clouds just like Christ did, and they too would be with Christ in heaven forever. That's what the story says. And the word precede is super powerful because if it's just a metaphorical change where these ones stood on the earth and were not joined together with the dead in the clouds, like Paul said, then precede doesn't work. Okay, because preceding something means going somewhere. Any other attempt at forcing that to mean something other than going somewhere just doesn't work. All right, and if you deny the literal ascension of Jesus, then you have to figure out where his body went. You have to figure out why he's never seen in body form again after the ascension. That you have to do something with because that is very important. If you believe that the God-man Jesus, the firstborn of the brethren, the one who they were told they would be like at his coming, if you believe that he literally floated up into the clouds, into heaven, and disappeared, and the people literally looked up into the, into the sky, into the heavens, just like the text says, and they watched him go up into the heavens, and they never saw him again because his body did not see corruption, then you must also believe, or at least be very well open to the idea, that the rest of the saints would also experience that change, just like Jesus did. Although not all of them would die, right? Paul said some of us will not die. But we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, because flesh and blood could not inherit the kingdom of God. So they were going somewhere, folks. They were going somewhere. And again, if you're in flesh and blood, and Paul said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, then what are we doing? Why are we forcing ourselves into a place that was never made for flesh and blood? So that's about going to wrap it up. I've done a lot of work on the rapture idea, a lot of separate audios. I know months back I said I was going to try to do one and just kind of tie it all together, but you know, there's, there's a lot of material on the rapture and I think just kind of breaking it up into short segments like I've done um, really, you know, helps with that. So if you want more, go back maybe two, three, four months and look around that time. I want to say I did about maybe four or five, maybe even six teachings that were all geared towards that. And of course I make mention of it in probably 50% of my audios anyway. So there's a lot of content everywhere you look. So anyways, just, yeah, the point of the proceeding is very important to take note of because the living were going to the same place that the dead were going. They just wouldn't go first. The dead would rise and then the living would be changed. And collectively they would be caught up together in the clouds, together in the clouds, in the air to meet the Lord. Because remember the Lord descended. He came down from heaven to the clouds with a shout, the shout of the archangel at the last trump, he called up his saints, right? He was the prototype. And when he appeared, they said, it says that they would have been just like him. They would marvel at him. That's what the story shows. It shows a marveling at him when he came in the clouds and descended for them and called them up with a shout. They would marvel at him. They would behold him, right? They would be blameless in the day of his coming. That's what the story says doesn't matter how unbelievable it is. It doesn't matter how fairy ish it makes it seem. That's what the story says. By you just forcing something totally unnatural onto the text, does it no justice, right? You're just doing that so you can play and you know it. So stop being dishonest. Let the story say what it says. And welcome to the Clarity Club. Anyways, that's all I got for today, folks. I hope you all have a wonderful day. And we shall return another day, another time, another place, and another rhyme. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.